feeling of fear, misunderstanding, so much so that literally during a protest march, the police had snipers on the roofs. Think about how crazy that is. These are U.S. citizens. You know, folks on the far right oftentimes talk about, as you may have heard through the Pew Research, uh, the vast majority of plurality of, of conservatives do not think that race uh, played a role in this particular killing, which is crazy. And they have the same uh, discourse around the whole Trayvon Martin case. So often, uh, folks on the far right talk about how much they just love America. Well, that's not true. What they love are Americans who look like themselves, Come on now. who think like themselves. They do not love me. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not love Trayvon Martin. Uh, folks on the far right don't love America. They love Americans who think and look like them. And as, as, as Sharpton said today, or, or rather at the funeral, this is an American issue. Listen, uh, Michael Brown is an American. Come on. Folks on the far Jeez. right. Uh, Trayvon Martin, he's an American. We lost one of our Americans. So when you talk about all this patriotism, all this shallow patriotism, why aren't you saying, oh my God, we lost a great American? Because in their minds, racialized bodies somehow strip away the Americanness uh, of the citizen. But see, what you just said about racialized bodies stripping that away, and you, then you say that they don't believe it was a racial issue, they're just not saying that they believe it's a racial issue. <laughs> right, because right, right. If, it, because if we know what the racialized vision is. We know that racism and racial issues have been at the center of the American national conversation since our beginnings, since our origins in this land. Absolutely. It's always been about race. And Du Bois wrote in 1903 in The Souls of Black Folks that the question of the 20th century would be the question of race. And that, that, that uh, statement still holds true today. And so anyone in America, be you white, black, or otherwise, who doesn't understand the impact that race has on everyday realities for all people, is fooling themselves and living in some kind of fantasy land. Mm -hmm. So we don't even need to deal with that as, as, as black people. What I mean deal with that is we don't even need to consider that as a possibility. We know it's a reality. Absolutely. We live that manifest reality every day. Every day. Absolutely. Every day. Absolutely. I don't want to uh, uh, keep harping on this. I just want to say one thing, and then, Tori, I want to come straight to you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Benjamin Crump, the attorney that was uh, uh, that worked for Fulton uh, on the Trayvon Martin case, he brought up the three-fifths rule african-americans mm -hmm. being uh legally defined as three-fifths of the human being right. and pretty much saying you know that's still how you look at us if you look at yes. us as human at all yeah. that we're not fully human and uh I, I was just very moved when he said that and he also said well even though you may think that we're not going to stand for michael brown getting three-fifths justice mm. so right. that was pretty powerful nice. but Troy, let's move to you i want you to tell our listeners about the mission and the programs of the family organization. Well, um, first of all, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Brother Dasher. You're always on the cutting edge. I, I'm honored to sit next to a young, up-and-coming, great activist, and you, my sister, uh, everybody that's out there. Uh, family organization was founded in 1992, and it came out of uh, my experiences as a black man in America who was raised by a single mother raising four boys in the urban ghettos of, of New Orleans, Louisiana. And so I thought that I needed to have a vehicle that I could uh, work through to do some uh, activities, projects, and programs that I thought would help to uplift our people. And quite naturally, looking at my childhood and the fact that I was always in search of some kind of father figure or some kind of male role model that could help articulate you know, my, my reality, I, uh, I thought that the first thing we would do would, would, would be to work with young people. And so we were intrinsically involved in the uh, gang truce movement of the early 1990s. And we would work with you know, young brothers and sisters who were in and out of the gangs and are affected by the gang culture and try to impart on them that they were in fact human beings. They were not necessarily gang members. This was a title that was attached to them for various reasons. And that they could transcend their environment if they took authorship of their minds, their hearts, and their spirits and begin to educate themselves. And so we utilized uh, examples, historical examples, like you know Malcolm X, like Paul Robeson, like W.E.B. Du Bois, Marcus Garvey, and others, who had transcended not only their own uh, immediate environment, but society's imi uh, uh, image of them as black men or black people. And they were able to 
uh, be remembered for contributions that they had made above and beyond their, their own personal desires. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have mentoring programs, we have uh, community festivals that we've done. The most well known was the Malcolm X Festival that uh, my organization produced for 15 years here in Los Angeles, paying homage to a man who I think you know uh, bears that kind of uh, tribute, Malcolm X, um, El Haj Malik Shabazz. And so, uh, you know, we are concerned about the human condition. Uh, we see a distinction between civil rights and human rights. We think everybody who's born on this planet has, you know, the, the, the opportunity to be a full human being, to realize their goals and objectives, and et cetera. So we do a number of different things. Uh, we have a, a film series called I Have Known Rivers, and that line is taken out of the Langston Hughes poem, and so on and so forth. And so right now, uh, we've entered Lock High School, we had a session today where we talked about this, this phenomenon that's going on under the umbrella of our mentoring program in association with the Urban League called See a Man, Be a Man. Mm -hmm. you know, and that title can tell you what this program is about. Absolutely. And these young men who are missing out on interaction with, with, with male role models in their lives. And so we're there to provide some kind of listening ear first, listen to them, love them, uh, hear them, and then help them and assist them as they move through their lives. Mm -hmm. Ife, when you first heard um, about the Michael Brown shooting, again, being so close in the heels of the, the whole Trayvon Martin tobacco, what crossed your mind and what moved you towards action? Um, actually, I was speaking about this earlier to Tori. Um, I woke up the next morning after the Mike Brown shooting and I just, I felt a heavy just weight on my chest and I couldn't describe what, what it was. But I came up with, I felt disposable. Mm -hmm. I felt like, I try not to get emotional when I talk about it, but I felt like as a black person in this country, um, and I, I think about my brothers and my cousins, my male cousins, being a black male, it's, it seems like it's synonymous to being a disposable and displaced person. Um, but it's not true. We're not three-fifths of a person. We're not disposable. And... Um, Kind of the the motto and the the subject of this rally that I've been organizing is every life matters. Our lives matter just as much as everyone else's. So that's yeah. And it's important that we talk about our feelings and get emotional about this topic. I mean, the good thing about about Trayvon Martin becoming kind of a symbol is that it inspires other people to get activated to animate themselves towards um, justice work. But in that, in the work of activism, it's easy at times to separate from the actual emotion that someone, some young life was shot down, gunned down, ended. And that is a very emotional process and project. So I'm happy that we can express our emotions and, and, and not try to, to untether emotion from someone getting killed who's someone's baby boy. I mean, right. hearing the mother talk about her son, when she said, I have a baby daughter, I have a teenage daughter too, but I have a baby girl, we're putting so much energy and life into this kid, you know. And, and right. Brown's mother said, you know, I, I poured so much into my son, and this police officer just took it away in an instant. And I was like, oh, my God. And so we should be emotional uh, about this type of a death. Yes. I, 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 I totally agree with you. And, I mean, we, you, I don't know how you can't be emotional when you think about looking down in a coffin at the stillness mm -hmm. of an 18 year old, your 18 year old baby, knowing you will never see him again. Mm -hmm. And and that there hasn't even been a police report mm -hmm. and they laid him lay in the street for five hours on top of it, like he didn't have anybody, like he was nothing. You have to be emotional. It hurts and it's angry. It makes me hurt, it hurts me, and it makes me angry. And I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm very hurt, and that's why I think I'm, I'm trying to direct all of this emotion. And if a, again, as a, as a, as a younger activist, as a college student, um, as we, as we know, unfortunately, the folks who've been getting killed, black boys, black young men, black teenagers who who've been unarmed and been shot, have oftentimes been about your age or younger. For you, as a teenage, as a college student, rather, how does it make you feel that, that the folks in your cohort are the ones who are being gunned down by the state? I, it's scary. I mean, it's, it's frightening, it's scary, and it's frustrating. Because 
it could have happened to me. I am Mike Brown. You know, I am Eric Garner. It could have been my brother. It could have been my cousin. So to know that, like you said, someone's mother is gonna have to look into a grave at their child, like I, you know, I can't imagine that as, you know, someone very close in age. It's so it's, it's very frustrating. You know, I just want to clarify something. I want to make it very, very clear because we have a lot of these conversations. Well, periodically, you know, we have these conversations on, on Beautiful Struggle. And I want to make sure people understand. I understand that police officers have a tough job. Yes. I understand and respect the fact that when they walk out that door, they don't know if they're coming back. And their families have to be strong just like... Uh, they do because right. that loved one may not come back. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't want to give the wrong impression and say that I don't respect what they do. But six bullets? Why? Ten shots. Ten shots? Six bullets? Right. Okay, so you have a job. You've taken upon yourself to have a job to protect and serve our boys that's not their job they, but that we got to worry about them coming home every day we got to worry about them coming home every day Teach. just like we they, they worry about the police coming home every day why is this that's right and those are the words of penny wilson really thinking about the role of the police but oftentimes in black communities we're not being served we're being shot uh, this is beautiful struggle we're live and direct every Tuesday night here, on, uh, here at 818-985-5735. Call us and join the conversation. Uh, the phone lines are already heating up here. 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. Kizzle, pizzle, fizzle, kizzle. All righty then. Go ahead, Well, you guys pause for the cause. Good. Great, guys. So we're going to come back and go...